I know you had a far more noble. That wasn't in my Winston Churchill quotes book. It's true. <laughs> you have just been to Malta, as you mentioned, and the Malta Conference is something that you established, the Our Oceans Conference. This was the fourth international conference. Give us a little bit of the good word on what those four conferences have produced in terms of commitments to protect Well, it's really exciting. Thank you, uh, Sheldon. That's a real softball, and I appreciate it. Uh, uh, it's been a long day for you. I'll save the hard stuff for later. Okay. Um, I wanted to do this in the Senate, to be honest with you. I was chairman of the Fisheries Subcommittee for a period of time, and I've rewritten the Magnuson uh, Stevens Lee law for several years in a row. Uh, at least three times we rewrote those laws. And I've traveled the country. I've talked to people in San Diego. I've talked to the fishermen up in Oregon and Washington, Alaska, uh, Maine. So I have a pretty good sense of our fisheries. And it was obvious to me that we're just not, we're not producing enough science on which to base the decisions for captains of vessels and to create a consensus on the implementation of things for the fishery councils, among other things. We're not uh, uh, ahead of the curve in providing an enforcement mechanism. And you have to have enforcement. You've got the high seas out there where you just don't have the ability to know what's happening. So I wanted to do it, and we just didn't have the money. We didn't have the ability. You know, we just, it, it, was, it was above our pay grade at that point, I guess. So when I became secretary, I kept telling my, the people in the State Department, we're going to do a conference here at the State Department. And at first, I think they thought they were just going to humor me. And it was a passing fancy, and they'd go in, and yeah, they really did. Because when I had my accountability meetings, I didn't see it moving fast enough, and I actually moved somebody out, moved somebody in, and made people understand I'm deadly serious about doing a real conference, a global conference, and we're going to bring people to Washington, we're going to make it happen. So it took me until 2014 to make it happen. I couldn't get it done in the fall of 2013. We moved it and did it in 2014. In 2014, we had people from all over the world come to Washington. We raised, I think, about four and a half to five billion dollars from great participants like the Pew Foundation, the Oak Foundation, the Walton Foundation. Rob Walton was there, others. And we put that money to use on doing a number of things. One, we've got to help the island Pacific states because they have serious challenges in terms of livelihood in protecting their, their, their areas. But we also uh, needed to create an enforcement mechanism going forward, so we started to work on that. We set aside marine protected areas in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I forget the exact numbers, about 215 million square kilometers of set-asides of marine protected areas. And we began a process of, of getting the port state measures. Are you all familiar with that? The port state measures is a mechanism by which we measure. We can have accountability on uh, fishing catch brought into ports in order to be able to guarantee that they are fishing legitimately and fishing to the levels that they're supposed to be fishing. And, and when, when we started this process, we had 10 nations signed up to the port state measures. You needed 25 to be ratified. At the end of this year, we are over 60 nations that have signed up. It is ratified, implemented, and the port state measures is being implemented all around the world. But what we did in 26, that what, what happened is I started to ask other countries, will you pick this up? We've got to keep this going. We have to create global commitment to this. And uh, Chile stepped up. Uh, and took it on for 2015. And I said, just to make things easy for everybody and create some momentum, we're going to do 2016 again. And I did that purposefully because I wanted to make sure we were coming out with the full accountability structure that we need. So we did it again in 2016. In 2016, we had $9 billion committed. And this year, Sandra, correct me, I think it was 6.5 billion committed in Malta. So at, at the 2016 event, three countries took on 
the promise of doing this conference each year in the future. Number one was uh, Europe. The EU just did it in Malta. Number two will be the Indonesia next year in Bali. Number three will be Norway, somewhere in Norway. And number four stepped up while we were in Malta, the, the, the uh, Palau. The island state of Palau wants to do it. And Russia came up at that meeting to me and said, we want to do the next one. So there's now competition in the marketplace to keep this conference, annual conference going. And what we did in 2016, what I'm really pleased with, we created a global, called Fishing Watch, where we are looking at the unprotected high seas and using military and using NASA and doing an interconnected process with the internet and transfer of information. And we're still working with militaries, coast guards in various countries, navies, when they do a transit, for instance, when we send a ship from San Diego to uh, the, the Pacific, we can drive it through with a mission to look at what's happening with fishing in certain high seas areas. So we can create accountability. So the other thing we did, we got President Putin. Uh, I went to visit with him in Moscow. The last thing I did in 2016, I was trying to break the, the Ross the Sea marine protected area out. Russia was the one country holding it up. And we got President Putin to agree to let it go. And so we have now the largest marine protected area in the world, which is the Ross Sea in Antarctica, set aside. So we, we, we got cooperation out of countries. And we have put oceans squarely on the map for the critical things that we have to deal with, fishing, acidification, pollution. And hopefully, uh, this will mark a turning point. Now, there's a lot more that can be done, which we have to do. We've got to deal with plastic. We've got to deal with education. People need to understand the ocean isn't this vast. It is vast, but it's not unharmable. It's not so big that we humans don't have the ability to damage it or even kill it. And people need to connect to that in the decisions they make about where they put waste pipes, what they allow to go into the ocean, what our rules are for shipping, for drilling. All these kinds of things really matter. But now we're building a global consensus about it. I think Canada wants to host this. There's just a real building momentum uh, about continuing this to create accountability and to have it connected to climate change. Let me um, flip you to another subject. You've been one of the leading national security uh, folks in our government, <clears throat> and you have both experience as a veteran in war and as a, a diplomat. You have seen the importance of our soft power, the importance of America's national reputation, the vitality to the world of America standing as a city on a hill. We've talked a bit about national security concerns of climate change in terms of inability to train and execute because of conditions on the ground, readiness issues, inability to maintain uh, facilities because they've flooded out or you can't land on them. Uh, and of course, we've talked about the issues of uh, climate change as a threat magnifier or as a catalyst of conflict. But talk about the national security implications of the United States right now being unable to take a leadership role in this and of the reason for that being um, internal dirty politics by the polluting industry. Is that going to go away as soon as we solve the problem with the polluting industry or is that going to be a more persistent stain? No, it's going to go away as soon as we solve the problem with our current president. <laughs> sure. I mean, I'm... You know, I'm not kidding you. I mean, uh, we're, we're not at the table. He's not at the table. I mean, this is really serious stuff. I'm, I don't want to be partisan. I really don't want to be partisan. I don't want to be perceived of as being partisan. I don't want to get into a whole thing about, about, about the president, except to the degree that you have to take note of consequences as they affect our nation and our interests. To not have ambassadors in many countries, to not have assistant secretaries of state so people know who they can call 
and work with, to not be able to attend meetings, to not be able to reach out on a par level and build relationships with other nations is to miss countless opportunities on a daily basis to make our nation safer. It's very simple. And there is no way in this globalized world where we have spent more than 70 years building up the security capacity of the United States by virtue of a rule of law structure ever since World War II, which has also buttressed our values, which are at stake here. And, and you know, I was with a group of people in Geneva last night. I mentioned them. I said, you know, someone was coming at me about sort of the arrogance of the United States and some of our policy. And I said, well, OK. Sometimes the beating of the chest about American exceptionalism gets a little hard for other people to listen to all the time. And I say to people firmly, we are exceptional. But we're not exceptional because we say we are. We're exceptional because we do exceptional things. We stop Ebola in its tracks in West Africa, which people didn't think would happen and a million people were going to die. But we sent 3,000 American troops over when we didn't know what we didn't know, and we built health care capacity, and that we didn't lose a fraction of the million people they predicted we would lose. We are on the brink because of our program, which I'm proud to say Bill Frist and I started in the United States Senate in 1990, whatever it was, 91 or something, when we passed the first AIDS allocation of funding, which then George W grabbed onto when, I, when we were recommending we take it up to 30 billion, and he took it up to 30 billion to his credit, and made it a big thing with PEPFAR. And now we're on the brink of having the first generation of kids born AIDS-free in Africa. Now, I don't see China rushing to do that. I, I could give you a long list of these things, folks, where I do not see other nations rushing to do that. It's us. When ISIS started marching across Syria and down into Iraq and potentially going into Baghdad, it was the United States of America, our president, Obama, who said, we're going to bomb these guys and stop them because this is a threat to everybody. And now, after a year and a half of the strategy we put in place, we have taken Mosul back, we've taken Raqqa back, we've taken away their so-called territorial part of the caliphate, and now we have to continue the battle because it isn't going to go away suddenly. But we're way ahead of where we were a year and a half, two years ago. But guess what, folks? I remind people often, no country in the world has conquered as much territory as the United States of America and turned around and just given it back. We gave Japan, that started a war against us, a new constitution and helped build their democracy. Germany that invaded Europe. We helped rebuild it with the Marshall Plan. And it's one of our strongest allies in the world today. So this works, this investment in democracy and in building relationships with countries. And we should not forget it. We can't allow this neo-national uh, you know, demagoguery to take away from America what has made America great. And, and I think we've got to stay focused on the fact that, uh, that this current trend line is losing us credibility and it's losing us security. Now, let me be very blunt one thing about it. The Iran deal, for instance. Folks, we know what the world looks like without an Iran deal. Because the day I sat down with the foreign minister of Iran, and I was the first Secretary of State to meet with the Foreign Minister of Iran in 35 years. The day I sat down with him, Iran had 12,000 kilograms of enriched uranium, which was enough for 10 to 12 bombs. They had a plutonium reactor they were rushing to commission in a few months, which would have produced enough weapons-grade plutonium for two bombs a year. They had 19,000 centrifuges spinning and working to turn out enriched material. And they had mastered the full fuel cycle of nuclear production. That's where we were. And they had a two-month breakout time. Today, they've agreed to live by the IAEA highest standards. They have the toughest 
regimen against them of any nation in the world right now. They're living by the greatest transparency. Their stockpile is limited to 300 kilograms, physically impossible to make a bomb with 300 kilograms. Their enrichment is limited to 3.67% for 15 years. And when it starts to go up, it's not as if they can suddenly go rush to a bomb because they're a year away and that stays for a while. And number two, we know exactly what they're doing because we have 130 additional inspectors they agreed to have. So we also know what the world looks like with the deal. And our president wants to go back now immediately to the place we were where there isn't any deal. It doesn't make anybody safer. Trust me. It, it just doesn't. There's no rationale under any security uh, evaluation whatsoever. So this is dangerous stuff right now. Going backwards in climate, backwards in nuclear proliferation, backwards on diplomacy, backwards on relationships. And, and I think, uh, you know, I don't know how this is going to play out, but we have to be very clear about where we stand and what is in the interests of our country and not be afraid to stand up and, and make it clear and so protect let's, ourselves. Let's end on a high note. Uh, <laughs> Sam Waterston is here and gave a speech earlier in which he called for, in a wonderful phrase, a battle-ready kind of optimism. Give us well, like your words. I of see a, that familiar shock of hair back there. Give us a, uh, your, your closing words to communicate a battle-ready kind of optimism. Well, the battle-ready optimism is to use everything that I think I've just said to you from the beginning when I talked about where we are and what we need to do on climate to Iran to other issues you know, here at home that make us stronger. Um, and feel confident about the future. I would not waste a lot of time. I think... I think people are spending too much time focusing on the tweets and on the twits and the twats and the whatever, and worrying about, you know, I mean, that's not going to change. And the people who support him are not going to listen to you. What we need to do is talk about better vision for our nation. We need to lay out better choices so that over time, People who aren't listening today hopefully can be made to listen or we can reach out to them. And what we need to do is have a massive American, inter-American communications process where we are once again settling in our nation on what are facts. As my former colleague, were you there when Pat Moynihan was there? No. Yeah. Well, Pat Moynihan famously said many times, Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. And that has never been more critical than it is today. You can't govern effectively. And, and governance everywhere in the world, by, by the way, is challenged. <clears throat> you can't govern effectively if you can't settle on what the facts are. So we need to start communicating at universities and colleges and community colleges and uh, you know, in every forum we can find to make sure we're building a movement in our country to restore the faith of our democracy in what is a fact, what is real. Because you can't build a consensus around building a high-speed rail or building new schools or investing in our country if people don't have a sense of why it's important and what difference it makes and what the economics are that you're basing that decision on and so forth. But that's just the beginning. We need to also feel confident about the vision that we define and aspire to. And I say that not to make you feel good, but because I, I, am, I am genuinely confident about the future, and I'll tell you why. We are curing diseases that we never thought we would cure. We're doing that. We're producing <clears throat> drugs that solve problems for people that they would die 10 and 20, 15 years earlier if they didn't have them. Technology is advancing life, length of life, quality of life, capacity of life, options for people, how you work, where you work, what you do. And as we do that, we're seeing the world benefit and transition. 
When I went to college, 1960s, the extreme poverty rate of the world was 50%. Last year, we went to below 10% for extreme poverty for the first time in history. 450 million people in China came into the middle class. About 400 million people in India came into the middle class. Go to Korea, in various places. Korea, 15 years ago, Korea was an aid recipient, and we were giving Korea aid. Today, Korea is a donor country. And there are countless examples of nations where our use of thoughtful soft powers brought them to a place of stability and, and progress. Now, if you look at what's happening in the world, there are 2 billion children between the ages of 15 and 24. There are 2 billion, they're not children anymore at 24, but there are 2 billion children legitimately who are 15 years or 1.8 billion who are one, 15 years or younger. 300 million of them are never going to go to school. Most of them are in South Central Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Asia, places where they don't have the same kind of political system and opportunity we have. They don't have the same vision. But nowadays, they're getting technology. So they're seeing what everybody else has which underscores to them what they don't have. And you're having greater failure of governance in various parts of the world, but I see people responding to that. I see greater accountability in the business world for accountability and transparency in the doing of business. I see people more willing to talk about corruption and challenge corruption in countries. If you're a woman in the world and you are pregnant in some other part of the world than America, you are 50% more likely to live in childbirth and to be able to have your child be fed and go to school. If you are, uh, I mean, a girl in Afghanistan. When we went into Afghanistan in 2001, there were no girls in school in Afghanistan. None. Frowned trend upon. There were one million boys. Today, people want to know what we're doing. Well, there are about eight million kids in school in Afghanistan today and about 45% of them are girls. And that's been happening for about 10 years. Uh, we, I told you about Ebola, I told you about AIDS. I look at what Putin did in Crimea. Well, look at what we did in response. We galvanized Europe, we held them together for four years, we put together sanctions, we kept Putin from invading Kiev and going right through Ukraine. We, we stood our ground. We did an insurance program for Europe. We strengthened the frontline states to $4 billion. So we're making progress, folks. What's happened is trade has gotten out of balance. And our own economic structure has gotten out of balance. And the anger that has fueled Trump's so what Steve Bannon has presented in the nationalism and everything is an abuse of the anger that people feel because people, are, people who were hit in 2008 are still hurting. And if you had a big mortgage in 2008, you still have your mortgage today if you're lucky, if you didn't lose your job and your house, but if you have your house, but your house is worth half of what it was, and you're still paying the same walloping size mortgage. But at the workplace, you're probably paying less because you've been cut back either in hours or pay, or you're not getting the advance. So that's pissing a lot of people off up and down the scale, right, left, and center. And what we need to fix and have confidence in, because we've done it before, is how people are rewarded for work and make certain that we have a fair tax structure in America where a whole bunch of people at the top aren't just getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier at the expense of all these people who are getting screwed. It's pretty straightforward. And we ought to be confident about the agenda, about that vision of where we go here, and confident that we can do it because we've done it before, we know it works, and we've seen the progress we're making on a global basis as more and more people come into decision making and participation in their countries. Look at what Saudi Arabia is doing. Mohammed bin Salman, he got rid of the religious police. And now he's got allowing women to drive, 
And his goal is to change the conservative culture that is restraining them from being more open and more able to participate in the world. A lot of countries are, are facing that now. What happened in the Arab Spring, in Tunisia, in Tahrir Square, even in Syria, had nothing to do with religion or religious extremism. It was young people who want opportunity and want a future. So I think if we offer the best vision of what that future is, and I think America does, we will. and we have confidence in who we are and how we do these things, we will continue to lead the world in a way that is appropriate, and we will continue to have people follow us and care about us and want to be like us as a result of that example we set. So it's a confidence on the future because of what is happening. And even technology, I know people are scared about artificial intelligence and what's happening. You know, in the, end of, in, in, in the beginning of the 19th century, 50% of America was in agriculture. You know what it is today? It's about a percent and a half to 2% are in agriculture in our country. But all those folks are working, people are working. Even the people have lost jobs in certain places. We're, we're below, four, what are we, four point some percent unemployment in the United States. We're almost at full employment. And, and so it's adjusting these other components of our society and bringing people back together again that is going to make the difference for our country. And I think that's the optimistic fighting optimism we ought to have is that we've got better ideas, we have real ideas, we know what makes a difference, and we have to have confidence about our ability to implement them. But unless we're involved, it doesn't happen, folks. And that lesson goes back to me even before my, my, my freshman year at, at Yale, we had, the, um, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis and a near nuclear war. My sophomore year, President Kennedy was assassinated and things seemed to come unraveled. My junior year, we became involved in the Civil Rights Movement. We got the Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Act passed and we broke the back of Jim Crow in America. As recently as the 1960s, we had signs up in America that said, white only, no colored allowed. And I remember driving down south when I went down there to see that, just being stunned that this was in our country post-World War II. We changed that. And then in senior year, we had Vietnam. And a whole bunch of people were affected by, I hope you've seen the Ken Burns film, by, by bad decision-making by lack of understanding, the same kind of lack of understanding that characterized our entry into Iraq, where people didn't even know the difference between Shia and Sunni. So I think we, we know what our, action, what our act, activism can achieve, and we should have confidence because we know what our activism can achieve, and you don't go to jail yet for what you say in the United States of America. So let's go out and get it done. John, thank you very much. Okay, man. I appreciate it.